Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Doug Holder, and um, I'm here on Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer. Um, and my guest today is Steve Blinds. How are you, Steve? Good. Good, Good to be here. Um, I first want to um, uh, announce that there's going to be a posy reading here in uh, Somerville at the Savannah Barber Press Studios at the Arts Armory this Saturday at 7 p.m. And I hope you'll all be able to attend. Um, and um, it's a great magazine. I happen to be the Boston editor for it. Um, I'm going to introduce Steve Blinds now. Um, Steve Blinds is a, a writer, poet, editor, and founder of the Wilderness House Literary Press. Uh, in addition, he is the um, designer for the Edison Street Press. He's also a member of the Bagel Bars of, of Somerville. And Steve has written a novel, Popular, Popular, Popular Hill, Popular Hill, which we will discuss among other things today on uh, Poet to Poet. Good to see you, Steve. Yeah, good. Now, um, Steve, um, your um, Popular Hill is based on your family history. You describe this as an American. You describe them as an American aristocratic family. <laughs> no longer that has any money. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what is that? Mean? Well, uh, my great-grandfather, uh, back in the 1850s and 60s, made a fortune. Uh, he, was a, he was a geologist. He made a fortune uh, doing work for the Tsar of Russia. And he basically mapped out the entire Ural Mountains and made a fortune setting up geology schools and came back and ran the geology school at Columbia University. Um, he was quite wealthy. My grandfather was uh, basically spent it. And uh, by the time I came along, there was really nothing left except a, uh, a family memory. So it sounds like Chekhov play. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, how did the family lose the family fortune? Uh, it's not totally clear. I think my grandfather made a bunch of very bad investments, um, and the depression pretty much uh, eliminated most of the money he had in the United States. The the basis of the story of Poplar Hill uh, was based on the fact that he had invested money in Germany after World War One, and when Hitler came to power, he blocked the mark so he couldn't be taken out. So my mother, at the ripe old age of 19, went there to spend it. And she used to say that she was um, Sally Bowles, only she had money. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever seen Cabaret? Sally Bowles is the, yes. the character there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's essentially the stories that she told as I was growing up were the, the stories that formed the basis of uh, this novel. Okay. <laughs> now, um, now, why did you change the narrator of the story from Bessie? The, uh, the, uh, <laughs> she was the uh, nanny. Oh, oh I, I, I attempted to write this story four or five different different times, and it never quite clicked. And at one point, uh, I was going to tell it from the, the point of view of her nanny, uh, Bessie McDermott. But as I got into telling the story, I realized that I was telling Bessie's story, not not the Katie Stevenson story. Um, so I, I put that aside and said, well, that's going to be the Bessie McDermott's story as opposed to this. And I tried several other ways. I was also at one point attempting to write a, um, a biography. And then my mother uh, just up and died. So at, at that point, I could no longer ask her any questions. I realized that most people she knew were also dead. So there wasn't much I could do about that um, in terms of writing a real biography. I also discovered as I was digging into the, uh, the backstory that sometimes the, the way she remembered the story was different from the way history recorded it, and sometimes his, the way history recorded it was far more dramatic than the way she remembered it, mm -hmm. being actually there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I finally said, never mind, I'm going to write this as, as a novel, as, as fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, having uh, sort of agreed with myself to write a novel, I could take great liberties with the story, which was quite, yeah. quite liberating from what I had originally tried to do. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now, you, you, you found an agent uh, for your book. Uh, how did you go about that, and, and basically how, how difficult was it? <laughs> oh, gee. I know. Well, it was, it's it not totally it clear I've got one yet. But oh, I thought you said, do. Well, she said, she said that she was interested. Uh, she has the full novel now. At one point, she edited the first 100 pages and said, go out and find a uh, professional editor who I did. I went and worked with an editor. Um, actually, the, the editor of the newspaper up where the, the, the story takes place in Poplar Hill, Nova Scotia, which is uh, in the middle of no place, um, in the middle of Pictou County, Nova Scotia. And the editor of the Pictou Advocate also happens to uh, edit romance novels on the side. And she volunteered to edit it. So we spent the last year basically going over it. And I think it's a much, much improved uh, story. So it's back with Sherry Wiener, and uh, hopefully she won't find too much to object to it, and she'll go out and sell it for me. Mm -hmm. And have you ever attempted a novel before? Not a novel. I've written five other non nonfiction books. Okay, but tell I me never, about those. Well, well they were te technical. Uh, they're called technical trade books. Um, they're books you find in a bookstore that are essentially um, uh, how-to books. They're all in the computer industry. And I, at one point, I had a reputation of being a, a, an edgy technical writer, which was, uh, it was a lot of fun because it was, a lot of it was fiction. I mean, I, I tell stories about how to do stuff, and I'd, I'd invent, I, I, I wrote a, a column called um, Panic that was um, narrated by a, an over-caffeinated, sleep-deprived system administrator working for the mob. So everything that could go wrong did and had to be finished, fixed right now. <laughs> Um, so I had a lot of, I, it was essentially fiction. So I had a lot of, a lot of fun writing fiction. Um, but uh, uh, I've never attempted a full-length novel before. I've written a lot of short stories, but not, not uh, this is my first attempt at a full-length uh, novel. Um, and um, did you give us the basic plot line? Okay, the basic plot line begins with, uh, and this part is true, um, I called my mother up uh, maybe 1992, 93, and said I'm coming up for the summer. And she said, great, you can come up from my wake. I said, I didn't know you were dead. And she said, well, I'm not, but you know, a, a wake is the best party a person can have, and the guest of honor rarely gets to enjoy it. So she declared that she was going to have a living wake. And uh, I got up there, not really believing her, but we... We went to a um, grocery store, and she went up and down the aisles, screaming to everyone in her mock Scottish accent, Are you coming to me wake? Are you coming to me wake? And everybody said yes. Well, the next morning, when the, when the wake was actually scheduled, the first thing I heard about four in the morning was the beep, beep, beep of a truck backing up, and it ended up being two, two TV remote trucks pulling in to cover her wake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all about, uh, about 400 people showed up. Uh, they uh, they set up a full full blown kitchen in her in her uh, uh, garage, and we had a blast. And just as um, it was coming to an end, the Heather Bell's all girl bagpipe band showed up and serenaded her. And it was hysterically funny. I have a video of it where I just I was laughing so hard I couldn't hold the camera straight. And she eventually marched when she decided everything was over. She grabbed the baton with her, and with the cane in one hand and marched the, bit, the girls back down to the um, school bus and put them back on and said goodbye and it was over in, in 10 minutes. We then ran, ran back and watched her 30 seconds of fame on the national Canadian news. Um, so it began that way. Uh, the next chapter, uh, and this also actually happened, uh, 1998 there was a uh, humongous uh, ice storm in Canada. Uh, and she was trapped in it, and she had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And for four days, she was sitting in her chair, and she couldn't get out of it. She had a very serious heart attack. The county eventually mounted an extraordinary effort to save her, and they got her to a hospital. Um, she never fully recovered from it, and 18 months later, she actually died. But in the process, um, the my, my brother is a born-again Christian, and... Uh, He's one of these people that's a connector with, he knows everybody. And he sent a never ending stream of Pentecostal preachers in to try to convert my mother, who often said that she was an atheist at best, and an uh, atheist at worst, and an agnostic at best. 
So she was not having much anything to do with that. But in the novel, I in invented a, a character down the road from her named uh, Mandy Best who showed up the most inappropriate times to uh, try to convert her to uh, Pentecostal Christianity. Uh, at the same time, she was talking to her best friend, uh, Barb, who really was a uh, uh, pretty much a local. She'd only been out of the county once. Um, her husband was completely illiterate. Um, but she's the, she was actually a total sweetheart uh, and the, my mom's best friend. So I used the dialogue between the two of them to describe all of her, the events in her life, um, which began when she was six years old. She was deposited in a uh, French convent school uh, where she only spoke French uh, until she was 13. And they received a telegram, and this, this part actually was happened to her. Uh, when she was 13, she was called out of class and um, told to go to the Mother Superior's office where her bag, she found her bags packed and Mother Superior handed her a telegram that said, no more money, send Kitty home. So the Mother Superior drove her to the train station, handed her a ticket to Paris and said, au revoir, that's the end of that. So at age 13, she had to find her way back to the United States, which she did. And she arrived on Thanksgiving morning in 1933 to discover that there were no servants in the house except for uh, Bessie McDermott, her, her nanny, and her, Bessie McDermott and her grandmother, and her, uh, my grandmother, uh, Kitty's, grand, Kitty's mother, were in the kitchen literally for the first time in their lives cooking a turkey. Um, we then go from there to, she, she went to the local high school, uh, New Canaan High School, the same high school I went to. Um, and in 1937, when she got out of high school, she went to Germany to spend the money that could not be taken out of, uh, of Germany because Hitler had blocked the mark. Uh, this, that part is also true. Um, it was about 500,000 marks, uh, five, uh, were in today's, in, sorry, 1937 money, it was about half a million dollars. Today's money would it be several million dollars and in two and a half years, she spent it. So she had quite a good time. But in the meantime, the events overtook her. Uh, the, uh, not, the, the Nazis constantly wanted uh, to take over areas that spoke German. So for the first couple of years she was there, Hitler kept saying he wanted to take over parts of uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria, uh, Poland. And every time there was a crisis, for one way or another, she would leave. And as the crisis, crises got worse and worse, she would leave more expeditiously. And at one point, uh, when she thought things were really going to, uh, to crash, she, uh, she managed to uh, get out just in time, uh, drove down the Adriatic to Greece, came back uh, to Germany just in time for uh, uh, Chamberlain to do his Peace in Our Time visit there. And I remember she said that she ran up to him and in those days, you could run up to, to presidents. They didn't have the same kind of security that they have today. She ran up to him and, and shook his hand and said, Magnificent, Sir Neville, magnificent. To which he replied, Well, I didn't know there were any Americans left here. And f for years, she wondered how he knew that she was an American. And she, someone finally told her that um, since he was a prime minister of England, he couldn't be a sir anything. So he knew that she was an American. Well, uh, that was in uh, September of 1938. Um, I'm sorry, uh, September, I think it was 1939. Um, basically, uh, Germany took over part of, of Czechoslovakia, the German-speaking part. Um, a few months later, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to, I think I'm getting my, my dates all mixed up. It's very complicated, and I don't remember them uh, completely. But when I was writing, I, I had a little chart on the wall that I check off when things happen. Uh, she, um, when everyone thought the war really was going to happen because Hitler declared that the, the Czechoslovakia no longer existed. So she and her boyfriend at the time got as far as Trieste, uh, which was an independent city state at the time, and could go no further. They, they, the, only, the only way out was on a Jewish refugee boat, the SS Dhaka. And 
Well, this is the, I, I should say, this is the story that I remember as a kid. This is not what actually happened when I actually researched it. The story that she told me, and the one that's in the novel, was she took the boat, the SS Daka, from, uh, from Trieste to Istanbul, where she got off, but she said it was, at the time, she said it was the most disgusting experience of her life. And the way she described it, the, the boat, was it was a boat that normally carried about 180 passengers. It was a mixed passenger freighter. Uh, but they had taken the, the two uh, uh, holds of the boat and put a dub double decks inside them with, with plywood and put another 900 people on that boat, and you were not allowed out. So each hold had 180 to 190 people in it. They were in the bottom hold on the, on the front, the, front uh, the, the bottom layer on the front, front desk and front uh, uh, hold. Um, and it was really, it was, it was quite disgusting. The, the reality is when I actually looked at her, she, she had a, uh, a valise, and I have a chapter called a valise where uh, she, had, she had thousands of photographs and she detailed who was who on the back of every photograph. And I found out that she actually got on the boat in Athens and made it, went from Athens to Istanbul. Now the boat itself had started in, in uh, Trieste went to Athens and then went to Istanbul where um, any Jews with money would get off because they could get overland to Palestine and the British didn't count that as part of the uh, uh, maximum number of, of people in, in which only I think it was 30,000 people at the time. Um, then the boat went on to, uh, uh, to Haifa and I discovered a video on the internet of that boat arriving in Haifa and it only made one trip. So I, I know the details of that trip. Uh, later on, she, uh, when she got off at, uh, at Istanbul, uh, Czechoslovakia disappeared. The crisis calmed down. She went back to Munich and decided that this time she, had to, she really had to leave. But this was just before, um, it was either just before or just after. I'm trying to, I can't remember what happened, but at one point, she said everyone in Germany knew what was happening. Um, but they didn't really believe it. Even the Jews knew what was happening. It was, but they thought it would be just another pogrom. They had survived pogroms, they survived this one. Um, she didn't realize what was going on, neither did, her, did some of her friends. Um, and then in the book, she had a number of, of Jewish friends who some escaped, some didn't. Um, I condensed the, the stories that she told me into one family where one brother escapes, the other brother doesn't. Um, but the, the, the daughter of the brother who didn't escape actually did make it to the United States. That was my first nanny. And I remember the, her, uh, she had a tattooed arm and uh, only spoke Yiddish. So growing up, I learned an awful lot of Yiddish in New York City. Um, but getting back to the story, um, on Kristallnacht, the, the night that the uh, the SS broke the windows of all the Jewish shops and burned down all the synagogues. She was there. And the night before, she was, well, she'd been living in Munich. Munich was the, the, was the uh, where the Nazi party was located and where Hitler actually lived. And she actually went to the cafe that Hitler hung out at, which was the Cafe Heck. And she was there the night before. Hitler called her over and they had a pleasant chat. Um, then she was told to go home, and she was sent home in a cab and told, go, in, you know, go home and stay home. The next morning, she discovered that during the night, that's when essentially Kristenlock happened. Uh, in the story, the, uh, uh, the family that, that she's trying to help escape come to her apartment, but the father is taken to Dachau. Now, just after that, now, by the way, I should back off a little bit. My mother always said that some of her friends she suspected of being spies. One, one character arranged for a bunch of them to ride their bikes past the Dachau concentration camp while she took photographs of it. She also wrote a dispatch describing all the events that she had seen uh, and sent hers to, I think the Associated Press took hers. And her photographs of Dachau uh, appeared in the United States. Um, Less than a week later, the United States severed diplomatic relations with Germany. The entire world knew what was happening. They knew they were going to war. They knew about uh, the Holocaust. Kristallnacht was really the beginning of the Holocaust. Um, 
Everybody knew they were going to war. Everybody was trying to buy time. In her case, she bought, she had pretty much run out of money at this point. She bought a first class ticket on a German boat back to New York City, left August 22nd, 1939, and arrived in New York City three days before Hitler invaded Poland. So that's essentially the, the, the German, the, the World War II side of the story. At the same time, her health is declining, and it's a race to see whether she dies before she uh, finishes telling the story. And it's a, it's, I wrote it so it's right down to the last paragraph, essentially. Um, I then added another, uh, another little section, which actually happened. My brother decided that he was going to hold another service for my mother. Uh, and he populated with these born-again uh, missionaries. And one by one, they all got up there, and they were telling the story about what a wonderful Christian woman Catherine Stevenson was. And of course, they didn't know her because she said she was an atheist or an agnostic. And <laughs> the last fellow who'd get up, and I have to do this with a, the Nova Scotian accent to, to get the, the, the feeling for it. He gets up there and he says, I was the last one to see Catherine alive. And he said, I asked Catherine, do you have any religious sterns? And she said to me, yes, Reverend, I do. I consider myself a lapsed Unitarian. And that was her parting shot. So that's the story, and that's how it ends. And I gave, all, gave it all away. Uh -huh. but I hope you like it. It's a good story. All right. <laughs> now, you, you have uh, designed, um, you, you, um, you have founded the Wilderness House Literary uh, Review and the press, and you actually publish books. What's mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you help people publish books for a fee. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the, uh, what's the uh, website for that? Uh, it's a, it was whlreview.com is the is literary review, um, and from there you can you can get to me via the press. Um, essentially, I, I started off trying to be a real, real press. Uh, we published a hardbound book called Dosha, Flight of the Russian Gypsies. It's an extraordinary book, um, but it requires an extraordinary amount of money to, to to popularize it, and we've we've only sold a few thousand copies. Um, so I I couldn't pyramid myself up and and publish lots of books so I had to sort of back off and become a uh, 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 what, what do they call them uh, 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 not quite a vanity press because I, I actually edit the books and I have to approve them I'm not going to just publish anything uh, I'm not a create space which will literally do, take anything and, and put it inside covers and call it a book um, I I like literature and I like new literature, and I spend my life reading other people's manuscripts mostly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and hopefully yours is going to see the uh, light well, of day. Well, yeah, or you can self-publish it, I guess. I could self-publish it, and I could, if I did, I could probably sell a couple thousand copies, which is not the, not the intent. Um, now I will if I have to, if I can't sell it anywhere else. But I think the point is that the, the, the major publishers, if they like a book, will spend enough money. To, to make it available, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of publicity and in terms of, of press run. Uh, printing books is not cheap. Uh, if you expect or even if you think you might get a review in something like the New York Times, you have to guarantee a press run of at least 2,000 hardbound. Um, you're t looking at fifteen, twenty thousand um, dollars 20000 if, if you do a significant press run and you do the proper publicity, you're probably looking at $50,000 investment. Which is why it's so hard to sell a novel, because I've been told repeatedly uh, by agents they would love to rep me, but I'm 63. <laughs> How many books have I got? Um, oh, one book would be good. Well, that's that's true, but but um, they repeatedly tell me that both the agents and the publishers are not so much investing in a single novel; they're investing in a career. So if I were 30 and presented with this novel. Um, they could reasonably expect 10 or 12 more books out of me. But at, six, at 63, I probably think I've got eight or nine books in me. Uh, I can probably generate a book every two years. Um, I've, I've got three in different states of completion. Uh, but it's a problem. It's a problem. So I don't know. If, if I can't sell it to a major publisher, I will, I will self-publish it. And we'll see what happens with it. Well, how about a small press? Sell it to a small. Well, small presses. Uh, I got there was a big article in the Globe today about the small yeah. beer press and how what success they had there out in East Hampton. 
Uh, it could be. I, I've, uh, I haven't uh, looked into too many of my com alleged competitors. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, there, there are an awful lot of small presses out there. And I don't know which ones would, would work for a novel, which ones have the, uh, the cachet to sell a novel. Um, I'm very familiar with the publishers that do poetry, because as you and I both know, we, we, between the two of us, we publish an awful lot of poetry books. Um, but uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, they, you know, <laughs> I design books for a lot of people. Um, and I, can, I know the mechanics of publishing. But for, quite frankly, I'd rather just sit back and write. The, the rest of the stuff takes an awful lot of time, which I have to do. And if I'm paid to do it, I do for other people. But for my own book, it's uh, one of those things I'd rather just write and let other people do that part of it. Now, you, you know, so when you work with an author, uh, I often hear about you. Um, and, you know, when you, you know, since you do work for, the, from, for, for my press, right? You, mm -hmm. You know, you're often um, your vision doesn't your vision always doesn't match the author's uh, <laughs> vision. Sometimes the author's vision is not an informed vision. Uh, uh, sometimes maybe you're yeah. just you know bullheaded. But what do you think? How do you I work that out? Well, I, I, I don't think I'm being such a curmudgeon that way. Um, a lot of authors have a, have an idea of what the book should look like. Uh, a lot of authors come to me with with a very badly formed cover. They don't even bother take the time to, to find out what the dimensions of the book are. So, or they'll give me an image that's, uh, if you look at a book, a book is a vertical image. Um, if you want a, uh, an image that spreads, that bleeds off the edge of the covers, it has to be a vertical image. Um, you can do funny things with horizontal images, but they don't work as well. They just, they don't look as good. They, you, you know, you have to do something with them. Um, that's the biggest issue I have with, with a lot of authors who, you know, come in with with wonderful, great ideas about what things should look like. They also don't the te they don't know the technicalities of book design. It's a very arcane, but very rule, strict rule enforced uh, graphic arts. Uh, you, uh, I've had books presented to me that that have allegedly been complete and ready for publication that have widows and orphans all over the place. Um, Widow, widows and orphans are when you, you don't have things lined up or you have uh, the bottom of the, the last line of a paragraph at the top of a page totally uh, it's totally against the rules and it's not it takes time to do to fix them sometimes books can be very challenging that way uh, poetry is relatively easy you, you try to break uh, uh, break on a stanza so you don't have you don't break a, a a page in the middle of a stanza. Sometimes the stanza is so long you can't. Um, but uh, there, there are always things like that. I mean, you, it's a profession. It's something you learn. Uh, it's with a considerable number of rules. So that's, I think, artistically, those are the issues I, I mostly have with authors. Uh, when it comes to the editing side of the house, usually we're pretty much on the same page. Um, except perhaps that authors don't realize that they might need editing. Um, I've often said that writers always see what they think they wrote, not what they actually wrote in the manuscript. So the story rattling around in the head does not really match what they actually wrote. And that's an editor's job is to make that sing, make it come out, make, them, make the two of them match. So those are the, two, the, the only real two issues I've had with authors, those, those things. I, I read a manuscript and I go, oops, this needs editing. <laughs> Sometimes Jonathan will go, no, it doesn't. Well, okay. <laughs> now, um, why, I don't know how much, you don't really have any time uh, to, um, to, um, uh, to read anything. We just have a minute or two. Do you? Let me see what I got. Uh, we only have like a minute. Maybe the, let's see, which is this one. This will do. This is. Uh, you only have like a minute, though. <laughs> uh, well, let me try. It was coming off. Right. This is Hanukkah, 1937. Um, just after we got, got back, the Nazis began to really intimidate the Jews. The Nazi police started to picket Jewish shops at random. Four or five polizai in uniform would walk back and forth in front of the Jewish-owned stores with signs saying things like, don't bribe from Jews, or usually something more impolite. 
If you looked like you were going to walk in, they'd yell Jew at you. They did that to me once, and I told them off in English, but fortunately they didn't understand me. Sam hauled me back and I was, as I was haranguing the cops. Kitty let out an audible harumph, which made Barb laugh. Well, After I think that's all you have to have time that's for. It. <laughs> yes. Poet to poet, writer to writer. Thank you.